But he says, hey, you don't, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I really like that. And I think that kind of goes back to the input measurements as well. It's, I love the idea of setting a goal and then working backwards, but then determine what are your inputs? Because if you're not measuring your inputs and you're not doing that consistently, then, then you're just kidding yourself with the goal because you're not, you're not gonna hit it. Uh, inputs are what, what's gonna get you there. And then systems is what's gonna get you there. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, that got my head spinning. <laughs> got the talk. wheels turning. Yeah. Ever since I was a young kid, I wanted to talk to successful people and entrepreneurs and learn from them. Fast forward to today, I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by a ton of successful self-made entrepreneurs who are achieving amazing accomplishments. This is a show where I sit down with them, I chat with them about my business, all the ups, all the downs. Welcome to the Tom Wayne Show. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Tom here. Welcome back to another episode of the Tom Wang Show. And today we have a special guest. His name is Brett Curry. He's the CEO and co-founder of OMG Commerce. And I'll let you, uh, it's really exciting for me because most of the guests that we brought on, you know, we talk about Amazon FBA, but the reality is that there's so many other ways to make money nowadays. Um, there's so many other business models. And Brett has built a very successful agency. And I've always had, some sort of a curiosity towards agencies. Um, I can definitely see the pros, but I also feel like, and maybe this is my blind side. It's essentially like, man, you have to manage all the clients. You have to manage all the employees. And there just seems to be like a lot of stuff going on at the same time. I feel like it's definitely more complex, but I think today we get to kind of, uh, hopefully Brad will be, you know, uh, reveal the curtains and, and take us behind the scenes of how he was able to build a successful agency. So Brett, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing today? Oh, Tom, man, doing awesome. And thanks for having me on, buddy. It's, it's good to be in this setting. You know, you and I talk a decent amount outside of podcasts. We both have our own podcasts. And so this is fun to be podcasting together. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Brett, you've uh, t take us back, right? So you have this. F first of all, tell us what OMG Commerce is so people can be like, hey, like, sure. okay. Yeah. Yep. So we are a digital ad agency. We, we have kind of two areas of focus, the Google ads ecosystem and the Amazon ecosystem. So on the Google side, it's Google search, shopping, and YouTube. We do a ton of stuff with YouTube. I was at a huge YouTube virtual event with the people at Google a couple of days ago, did a live event at the YouTube LA offices uh, just before all the, the lockdowns and stuff last year. And so that's a huge area of focus. And then uh, and we do ad creative. So we create ads and run campaigns, do media buying, all that. On the Amazon side, we do a lot with PPC management there, sponsor brand video creation and management, Amazon DSP. And then we're, we're offering full service, although it's kind of limited right now in terms of the, the, the capacity we have, but we do have a full service offering there to a certain degree. And so, yeah, so that's kind of the, the quick look. How, how big is the team now at OMG Commerce? Yeah, so we're right around 50. And, and that does include a handful of freelancers, all US-based, um, but yeah, just, just under 50. Yeah, so I'll, talk, I'll, I'll kind of talk more about OMG Commerce. I, I first met Brad, I think through, refer, oh, through um, our mutual friend there. Um, oh my God. I'm blanking on the name. I'm trying to blank too. Like, I can't, yeah, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyways, I apologize. I, I, it's going to come back to me. But uh, we, we got introduced and uh, we tried over a, when we were running Sadara, we've tried many different agencies in the past. And uh, OMG was by far like the one that we worked with for the longest time. Was it, was it Jared Mitchell or was Jared it Jared Mitchell? Else? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Bingo. For some reason, I, I don't know why the word, the name Chad kept on popping up. Uh, his brother's name is Chad, so maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to Chad, so um, yeah, it was it was Jared Mitchell. So thanks for an introduction, Jared, if you're listening to this. But we worked with a lot of different agencies, and I think there's different components of a successful agency. Number one is like, can they actually deliver what they say they can, like like results oriented? But the other one's also like system oriented. So meaning like, hey, are we getting the proper updates? Are we getting the proper uh, reporting? Are we how's the working relationship between the two? So that's why I think like agencies are somewhat of a more complex business. Um, but Brett, I mean, you're the one that's built this up. So can you talk to us a little bit about 
maybe actually, you know what, let's do this. Let's talk about the beginning. Like how did you sure. get into the agency business in the first place? Yeah. So I found out that I loved advertising at a, at a pretty young age. I used to like infomercials and I like to watch commercials. So it's kind of a weird, weird thing, but <laughs> loved commercials. I actually worked at a radio station in college and I got through a little bit of everything because it was a small radio station, but I, I started selling ads and I realized this is kind of fun. It was also brutal at times too, but it was kind of fun. So I changed my major to marketing. So I like went all in on marketing and advertising. And so, so I knew I wanted to do that right out of college, took like a leap of faith and built a small agency serving local businesses. So I was doing TV, radio, direct mail. I was consuming like Jay Abraham content and Dan Kennedy and, you know, direct response type ad content. And I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the psychology of it. You know, what makes people react, what headlines work, what offers work, you know, just, just all of that. I, I fell in love with marketing. And so I realized though, that, that I, you know, I'm pretty good at taking care of people. Like I, I like to serve people. I, we, my wife and I love to have people over. We like to host. We like when people are happy. And so kind of this combination of, but I'm also like technical and, and I like math. So that, that kind of just is a good fit for my personality. Where okay, So what are you not good at then? You seems like you're uh, no, not everything. Well, so believe it or not, I'm not good at detail. So um, I always liked math. Like I was pretty good at trigonometry and, and stuff like that. Bad at accounting though. Like just little details, little numbers. I lose interest and I and my head goes somewhere else. And so detailed stuff and and you even talked about systems systems are super important i am good at evaluating a system giving input on a system i'm not very good at following a system mm. myself mm. um my wife always makes fun of me for like painting a room i'll like paint a little bit here and then i get bored <laughs> and i like paint a little over there and she's like, what are you doing i'm like yeah. i'm bored i don't know i like, don't worry it'll get painted i'm just <laughs> not following the system come together yeah it's, 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 it's all gonna be blue it'll be fine yeah exactly uh, yeah. So, but the agency life just, just seemed to fit. And, and I like to connect with people. I like, I like the idea side. And um, so, yeah, the agency model is not for everybody because you do need kind of all the things you talked about. You need systems. And, and so, especially as you scale, you're with 50 people, how do we keep systems so that the level of service is, you know, meets our standard across all accounts, but then also how do you hire people that are also flexible enough to say, okay, yeah, this is our system, but this client needs a little something different. Like, or this mm. weird thing happened in Amazon, let, let, let's figure it out and let's fix it. And so you also kind of have to be flexible there a little bit too. So, um, so probably a lot to unpack there, but, but it just seemed like the agency was a good fit for my personality and what I enjoy to do. I'm not actually a great at, I know guys like you, at least I think you do this, you know, invent products or think of, oh, there's, you know, I, I can't, I can't do this with my grill. I'm going to invent a product. Mm. I, I can't invent products, but if there is a product, I can think of a good hook and a good angle and the right audiences. And, you know, I could, I could promote, promote it like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so anyway, so that's why agency life is good. Good fit for me. So when did OMG commerce start? Which yeah. So uh, I had a, an agency and then my business partner, Chris Brewer, he had another business. Uh, we were friends for a little while in 2010. We had this crazy idea. We were at a, a conference. It was, a, it was actually a Dan Kennedy super conference. Uh, actually, and uh, funny story, Russell Brunson was kind of up and coming at that time. Mm. So I, got to, I, I just walked up to Russell Brunson and introduced myself. We ended up talking for a while. And ended up that started a partnership for a little project called DCS Local. But, but anyway, uh, Chris Brewer and I were like, hey, let's, let's like try something just for fun, a project. And it kind of had to do with the Russell Brunson DCS Local stuff. So we, we started the company in 2010 without really – a clear picture at all what it would become or if it would become anything like it was just mm -hmm. a project and then as we started working like the first thing we offered to businesses we sold like i don't know forty thousand dollars worth in a matter of a few months and we're like uh there may be something here mm -hmm. <laughs> and then and then we started building a little bit but but the funny funny enough we always thought it would, would just be he and i and like some you know a, a couple of employees to help us mm -hmm. but i quickly saw we're gonna need to build a team and so i went deep into like the e-myth revisited and all this stuff. And, and I built some teams and in, in ministry and done some other stuff. So as I, as I looked at it, I was like, I think this will be fun to build a team. I know a lot of people say they hate employees or hate having employees, but I thought, no, this, this, this could be fun. And so lots of, you know, ups and downs and lessons learned in building the team, but, but just super grateful. We got an awesome team, you know, so now we are here, we are 11 years later and uh, still growing. And I'm still, I think I'm more excited about the agency now than I was then, which I'm really grateful for that. Uh, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. So I guess in the first few years, like, I, I just want to kind of understand the timeline of this agency. So at the very beginning, obviously, you and Chris did all the work. 
Um, yep. and what, and then you guys sold $40,000 of advertising. You guys had to fulfill that and so on and so forth. Can you maybe talk to a little bit about the trajectory of the business? So like, was it slow the first couple of years and then kind of grew like a hockey stick or was it always kind of constant, constant, constant growth or how does that work? Yeah. So we hit, we, we were growing pretty rapidly every year. We did hit a, at least a, a couple of years and I'm really bad with dates. That's another thing that <laughs> I remember moments and I remember concepts, but dates are bad. So this could be way out, but I think it was like 2016 to 2017. We were almost completely flat because we were really, we figured out, okay, our systems are not built to scale. So we got, mm -hmm. we had to restructure so that we can scale. So we kind of uh, remained steady and then we took off and so we made the Inc. 5,000 list three years in a row, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, so in the beginning, you know, we were like, Hey, what, what are we good at? Well, you know, and this is maybe a little bit bravado because we're entrepreneurs and, and we did know a lot about marketing. So like, well, we can do everything. So, you know, if somebody needs a website, we'll build a website. We'll bring in developers and we'll build it. And if you want some direct mail to go along with your online marketing, sure. Yeah. Cause uh, Chris had some direct mail background and so we're just doing like everything. And mm. we quickly found that there, that is, it's impossible to scale like that. Mm. And we can't be amazing at anything, even if we're, you know, pretty good at a lot of things. And so we really found that, hey, we're great at search, mm. great at SEO as well, which, which we've actually gotten out of the SEO game. It's, it's just too, it's not fun. That, that, that's kind of the bottom line, but <laughs> get out of, get out of the, it's still effective, but it's like a long haul. And it's like, hey, pay us for four months. You might get results. You might not, mm. uh, but we're going to put in a whole lot of work, you know, anyway. mm. uh, so we're, we're out of the SEO game, but uh, we're good, good at SEO. And then, and then we're pretty good at, at video. And, and so um, started to kind of move in that direction. And then later, um, I realized, that, man, I really loved e-commerce. So for a while I was running kind of the e-commerce side of the business. Brewer was running the, the local, so, you know, local franchises, right. Uh, auto shop, stuff like that. You know, he was kind of running that. I was running e-commerce. We, we, we realized a few years in like, Hey, e-commerce is where the real scale is. That's where the real growth is. So we, we pivoted and went full e-commerce. I don't remember the year, but it was maybe, uh, 16, 17 in, in that, in that, uh, ballpark. We, we oh, wow. really committed to, to e-commerce at that point. Right. And I, I think there's two important lessons to be there learned there uh, about what you said. Number one is niching down. Yeah. I think it's so easy for us to say like, Hey, we offer everything. Like, Hey, wh what's your business good at? Everything. We're good at yeah. everything. Um, you're not well known in your space for that one thing. And I think it's so important to be, to, to, to earn that mind share of a customer. So it's like, Hey, do you know anybody who's good at like Google PPC? You own the mind share exactly. of Google PPC, yeah. right? Yep. Um, that's number one. And I think number two is the realization of like pivoting. It's a lot of people, they do the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting a different result. Whereas mm -hmm. I think in entrepreneurship, it's really important to do step back, look at everything from a bird eye view and then say, how can we change? How do we, you have to adapt, you have to pivot. And I think that's a really important lesson for entrepreneurs is things do not need to stay constant forever. You started a business, you're the creator of this drawing. You can erase everything and redraw. You can <laughs> yeah. add a chimney here. You can do anything yeah. you want. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's both freeing and a little bit scary, but mm. mostly freeing. Like it's just, it's, it's really cool. And so, yeah, for us, one of the first things, you know, as we started to kind of narrow our, our focus and figure out what we're good at is I, I became obsessed with Google shopping. Like Google had some great results early on with a couple of clients. And I thought, man, nobody's talking about Google shopping. This was like in 2012 when it had just become a paid platform. Mm. And I thought nobody's talking about this stuff. So I really started experimenting. I went like full obsession into Google shopping for, for months and months. And uh, ended up on a uh, podcast. Uh, I don't know if you know Austin Bronner, e-commerce influence, but friend of mine. Uh, so I ended up on his podcast, and someone from Shopify was listening to that podcast. So oh, I, wow. I got an email from this guy at Shopify. He's like, "Hey, um, I heard you mention you may be doing a Google Shopping guide. What if we did that together?" And I'm like, trying to hide my excitement, like, "Yeah, I think we could probably make that happen." <laughs> you know. And so, uh, so I did that. So I wrote this guide. It was a monster guide, like 56 pages, but it was, you know, wow. the ultimate guide to Google Shopping. And Shopify published it. And so that was huge wow. too. And so then that led to more speaking gigs and podcasts, stuff like that. So, so yeah, I, I love that. I'm glad you underscored that. What are you really good at? So we became really, really good at Google shopping. And then that led to some other things as well. And I think, I think you see that in e-commerce too, where 
like a bonobo. So I think is a good example. You know, they, they mastered the, the chinos or the, the slacks for guys, right? Just perfected it. Mm. And then as that really took off, they thought, well, guys love our brand and trust our brand. Now, now we'll do shirts, right? And then we'll do other things. And then yeah. they started to expand. And that's kind of the approach we took as well. Google shopping, e-commerce, like just double down on that. And then we started expanding because we were pretty good at video and we did understand some other things. And so then we did that natural expansion that's been really fun and also serve our clients well. Right. And I think going off of that, like uh, something for marketing, I guess, like with marketing, one of the most important things is kind of your headline or your hook. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, so I mostly, you know, sell products on Amazon, but right now I'm definitely learning like D2C. I'm launching a new brand and I want to do focus more on the direct to consumer side of things. And I think having that, for example, our derma roller, right. For Sadara yeah. skincare, yep. like it's for yep. different uses is it different problems that can be resolved, but we don't actually know which headline and which messaging can relate to our customers the best. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, like would you say the best way is to test different headlines and test different problem solution, you know, et cetera, et cetera, different types of ads, and then kind of see which ad performs the best or which one has the best click through rate or which one has the best engagement, whatever it might be. And then you can safely say, okay, Sudara skincare, derma roller, there's many different uses, but let's target this use first, this problem first, because this one has the best result. Once we own the mind share of that use, then we can move on to the next ones. Would you say that's a good approach for like e-commerce side of things? Or what would you say, like how to find that, I guess? Yeah, I, I love it. And, and so I think there's a, there's a few steps there, right? And one of the things I like to talk about is you want to find with any product or, or service-based business, find what is it that you do best? What is it you do really well mm. that overlaps with what the market wants most, right? Or at least, at least what they want pretty strongly. And so if you have an understanding of that in the beginning, then you can kind of build upon that. But sometimes you don't fully know, right? You don't fully know the angle that's going to land with the most people. So that's where you say, okay, we're, we're really good at, at this. And we think that's what people want too. Now let's test different variations of that, different headlines of that and see uh, what, what comes out. Right. And, and so one of the things we talk about, and we, we do a lot with YouTube ads now, right? So, so mm -hmm. Several years ago, like 2015, 16, 17, we were the Google shopping agency. We're still really good at that, but that's not what a lot of as many people want now. They want, they want YouTube, right? So uh, a lot of people advertise on Facebook. Some want to diversify with YouTube. So we've been become known as, you know, the YouTube ads for e-commerce agency. Hmm. And, and so anyway, one of the things we talk about that with YouTube ads is you need to have a hook, right? So that what you say in the beginning is super important. Right. And you need like, you need your one thing. And then your supporting cast. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So, and this will be kind of an old advertising example, but it's still, it's still uh, worth discussing. Uh, Volvo, right? They always were known for, do you remember what they used to be known for? This is kind of old. So safe, you're pretty young. Like safety. Yeah, exactly. Safety. So yeah, yeah. Volvo's like safety, safe car, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Some of them are, are uh, pretty, or at least that's maybe debatable. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But safe, we're a safe car. So safe appeals to what people. And so then they can kind of make their, their uh, then they can test headlines from there. So we know there's a certain audience that really wants a safe car. That's what we're best at. We're going to then uh, test different things there. Mm -hmm. uh, Boom by Cindy Joseph, Ezra Firestone, awesome guy, good friend, been running his Google search and YouTube for, for years. Their one thing is, is pro age cosmetics. So don't try to turn back the clock and look 20 embrace who you are as a 50, 60, 70 year old female, right? Their, their, their model, their spokesperson was a gray haired model, beautiful, but like you're, you're powerful, you're beautiful. Don't try to change yourself, just look great. Mm -hmm. But then they have supporting elements, supporting cast, right? So other benefits that go along with that. Mm -hmm. So I think when you understand that, you understand your one thing and you understand your supporting cast and you just, you test combinations and you, and you test different hooks and you see what the, the market responds to. And I, so, but I, it, yeah, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, so last thing is just if you're if you're self-aware about your product and as aware as you can be of your audience, then that's the place to start. And then and then use testing to really uh, zero in on the right approach. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think when you launch an e-commerce product, it is somewhat important to know the product very well and know the yeah. audience really well. But then for Ezra, I think uh doesn't really apply to him in that case because he's I think he's the polar opposite of his demographic which is like older you know females and he's like a younger male so it's like <laughs> no. quite quite opposite yeah. 
Um, yeah, but he he part you know his his, his business partner Cindy Joseph right. uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, but um, you know they they were a great partnership together, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, exactly. He's not he was not his target market is not his target market. Right, but he had a business partner who was, and they yes. collaborated on all these different things. Yeah, I, I would actually love to know kind of like what other messaging they tried before the pro-life. I, th- I think a lot of people think like, oh, day one, they just came up with this tag and they started working. I'm sure they yeah. tried many different other things. So it'll be interesting to see like what other angles they did, did they did try uh, yeah. beforehand. As so as a, a very, couple of, yeah. a couple, I, I can actually shed a little bit of light on that if, if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So yeah. they, uh, from the beginning, they were pro-age. Now, I'm not exactly certain if that was the, a term they used from the beginning, but that was the thing. Like Cindy had stopped dyeing her hair. She became a, she became a model because someone spotted her. I was like, man, you're beautiful, but I like mm. the gray hair. And so anyway, so, so then she designed just a simple, the boom stick was the first thing she designed. And so uh, I, they were pro age, at least at heart from the beginning. I'm not sure if that's the word they use. Mm-hmm. One thing though, that has been interesting that they've been testing is for cold traffic. They've tried all kinds of things, right? So they got different products. They got, they got moisturizers and mascara and other, other products, but the, the main product that's worked for top of funnel is the boom stick. They've tried skin care and other things, and it is not, we've not been able to get the right CPA for that, hmm. but the boom stick, which is kind of a makeup alternative, it has worked. And so I think that's also part of it is, is what's the nature of your product and mm. what's like the right product to get someone into your brand. Mm. And then you can sell them other things. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's been interesting to, to watch and to be a part of. Yeah. Wow. That is super. Yeah. I guess it's, it's like the gateway drug. It's like the gateway. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's the gateway product, yeah, sure. right? Yep. Huh. Yep. That's, that's really, have they ever found out like why that might be it? Do they have any thesis? I'm like, yeah, I, I think so. I think it's mainly theory and, and just hypotheses right now, but I, I think it's just, it's harder to stand out when you're, when you're just talking about a, a moisturizer, although this is really, it's a better moisturizer, right? And it is, and it's, you know, made from honey, you know, bee products and stuff. Right, but the the boom stick just really it's visual, it's unique. You just apply mm. it, and then you don't have to do makeup if you like kind of a minimalist makeup look. So mm. it's the most visual, it's the most unique. It's mm. just a clear value prop as you see it. Whereas mm. skincare, I think you know moisturizer as an example, it's easier to just say, eh, I don't know, I, I, my moisturizer is fine. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I think I think that's I think that's part of it. Right. So differentiation is huge and having that clear value prop is massive. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, a, a, he's, I don't want to turn this podcast into, you know, talking about Ezra, but he's a very yeah, exactly. interesting guy yeah, from at least, I've never talked to him. I met him one time in person, super nice, but seems like he's like doing so many, pro- like he's got Zipify, right? He's got the uh, Zipify. He's got a few e commerce brands. He's got Smart Marketer. Um, sorry. Smart, Smart Marketer says, is his training company so they, they do events they've got the blue yeah. ribbon mastermind and then some other courses and stuff i did a youtube course with him yeah and it seems like he's living like a really low-key life he's like I, I don't know where he lives but it seems like he's always in, in new york somewhere new york. yeah oh he lives in upstate new york yep yep oh it looks like he lives in like some junk like weird forest somewhere like his house is yeah like, yeah they've got a bunch of acreage uh like uh, a couple hours from the city or something got it got it yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like seems like wow this guy's got like it's got all the business side of things but he's also got the personal side of things like very very like separated and it's yeah. like for me at least when i look at him i'm like man in order to build something like that, don't you need to work on your business like 20 hours a day? But I guess that's what happens when we have good people in the organization, right? Just like you. Yeah, and, like I, and I think that's the key. And, you know, we, we uh, eventually I, I aspire to be more like, more like Ezra in that regard <laughs> where, you know, we're, and we've got amazing people in place. We've got an awesome COO, Sarah Still is her name. She's crushing it, managing kind of the day-to-day of, of the people and some of the processes, which frees me up. But eventually, you know, I want to kind of start some other things and have some other things going. I love the agency. No, no plans to, yeah. to shift gears away from that at all. But yeah, I think, I think you gotta have the right people in place, the right, the right systems and the right structure. And then in some ways you gotta be able to let go too. Like he, 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 uh, now Molly Pittman and John Grimshaw, they're running smart marketer, the, the training mm-hmm. company, you know, so Ezra's stepped back from that a little bit. He's still running the mastermind. So I think, I think that's it. Yeah. I think you gotta get the right people in place and be willing to, uh, you know, almost go Jeff Bezos a little bit where Bezos is no longer the CEO. Now he's the executive chairman. He's still going to be involved, confident, mm. but, but, you know, just, just being able to, to, to map out that transition and then, and then execute in that transition. Absolutely. So you have 50 people. I'd love to talk a little bit about 
hiring. Um, yeah. T- yeah. T- like, I, okay. I'm going to be a little bit selfish. I'm going to give you sure. kind of my, uh, my business problem right now, that Absolutely. I think, I think will bring a little bit more context to this than just talking about theory. Yep. So I think my biggest issue right now is bring in the right people. However, giving them clear KPIs Mm -hmm. for them to know what their job is and how it feeds to the overall vision of the company. And also making sure that they are performing at those tasks and KPIs. So I would love to kind of, knowing that's kind of my problem, I guess, like I'd love to just get your advice on, hey, when we hired like a like an executive team, for example, someone on the higher up who reports directly to me, like mm. you sell them on the vision of the company, you give them the KPIs, and then you just kind of leave them and do their thing. And or do you check with them every two weeks? Or like how does that process work? I guess. Yeah, uh, love this question. I I think if you look at you know our job as 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 founder as CEO is really. Uh, about protecting and advancing the culture, bringing on the right people, and then, you know, advancing the brand ho- however we, we can. And so for us, like it, it just quickly on the, on the hiring side of things, um, you know, we had to work really hard. I think, I think part of this is once, once you become a really good culture and a really good place to work and we, we just made, um, actually, I don't know if I can announce that. We just won an award, but I don't think, I don't know if I can, okay, scratch that. Won an anyway, award. We, won we've, an award. Yeah. we've won some, uh, good places to work awards anyway. Nice. Um, so, you know, it takes a little bit of time to build that up. And we, we, we had some false starts and we, there was a time in the business where I kind of looked around and thought, I don't really like the culture here, right? This was mm. maybe five years ago or so. And so we, we really worked hard to, to revamp that. So you, you kind of have to, to get that short up and then you'll start attracting the right people. It's easier to attract the right people. Yeah. But on the hiring process, you know, we, we hire for culture first. We do a couple of unique things. You know, the, the interview process is important. And we do about four interviews before we hire somebody. Um, we also love giving people exercises. So if they're going to be an account manager, like here's a couple of client scenarios. How would you create verbal communication with the client based on this? Mm-hmm. Or you're a, a, a applying for Google ad specialist. Here's a made up brand. Just walk through what you would do in these, in these scenarios. What kind of campaigns would you create? How would you optimize? Things like that. Mm. Um, then we also, we use tools. So we use tools, uh, the, the, the tool we use is called culture index. I really like it. It's a, it's a test someone takes and it's going to show you really, really how they operate. Are they detail oriented? Mm. What kind of autonomy do they want to need? What's mm. their social, uh, uh, ability? What's their detail orientation? Uh, but there are other tests, right? Like I think even the Enneagram could work right or, or disc or whatever. So I think having that, not that that is the only tool you use, but it's, but it's a tool and it helps. So we found as we started combining these tools and multiple interviews, we don't always get it right, but we usually make pretty decent hires, right? Based because of the way we approach it. So that's super important. So I guess also like if you hire the right people and using that tool, you hire the right people. And let's say you hire like five account managers, for example, and then they all crush it. They all do really, really well. You can kind of go back and look at their test scores and be like, Hey, exactly. here's like, exactly. they were really good at this. They were really good at this. They weren't so good at this. And then you kind of, yep. next time you get a new hire, they're not very good at that. You're like, well, that's a red flag because everybody yep. else is really good at that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what we did in the beginning is we we actually we kind of built profiles. We we said, okay, this is this is really what an account manager needs to to be. And hey, here's here's our best AM up to this point. You know, what does her profile look like? And so we we kind of model that in the beginning. And then yeah, you're absolutely right. Then as you see performance, and you say, ah, this is the this is the profile that indicates man, this person is geared up to be an X, Y, Z. And so now it's kind of fun. And, and, and I've really gotten into this, this tool. So now I'll get a, a, get a profile and I'll be like, I haven't met this person. I haven't seen their resume. I say, but they would be awesome as an account manager. Mm-hmm. And then we all, obviously we'll have to verify. And if they're right out of school and have no experience, then, then maybe we don't take a chance. But um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's an extra, it's a nice extra tool to, to use. How important is, let's say that you, yeah, how important is previous experience for you? Yeah. Um, so previous experience, I think is super important, but not maybe in the way most people think. So I, I definitely want some previous experience because I want to see 
how do you operate? How do you operate in, a, in an environment that's challenging and difficult? Or, you know, if, the, if there's, you know, complex problems you're trying to solve. So I definitely look for relevant experience that's going to indicate, yeah, they, they can figure stuff out. So one of the things we look for, uh, just we'll take the Amazon side of the equation for a minute, the Amazon uh, ad side specifically, there aren't that many people out there with Amazon ad experience, right? It's a relatively new thing. You can't, you know, we make posts on Indeed and other places and occasionally we get someone that applies with Amazon experience, but not a lot. We've actually found a lot, uh, found a lot of success with people from uh, banking and other like technical, analytical, data-driven type jobs. We got a guy that we hired who was a, uh, he, he would like evaluate loans and evaluate credit, just, just like number cruncher, mm. spreadsheet master, stuff like that. Mm. So we started talking to him about ads and we're like, hey, it really comes down to data. And, and so, he, but he's been fantastic, right? So I do want to see some experience that you can handle difficult things, that you're a, you're a finisher, that you are detail oriented, that you're not going to fold under pressure. But I, I, we don't always look for someone that's got specific experience in what we need them to do. Mm. Right, right. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. So I, my, my, my next question was not super helpful. My next question was more about, I guess, um, actually, let's talk about onboarding because that's, yeah. that's a really important part. Like once you hire someone, they make it past the four interviews, the personality test or whatever test you want to call it. Hey, welcome to the team. How does that process work? How long is the onboarding, onboarding process? Who takes care of that? Uh, their direct managers take care of that, I assume, or how does that work? Yep, yep. So their direct managers, so kind of the department lead, handles that that most of that onboarding process. We try to really make a big deal out of it, and you know, celebrate this person in our Monday morning meeting, and call them out in our group Slack channel, and just really celebrate, like, hey, we were really excited that you're on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, the 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 department director will kind of oversee the training, but. We have a, a series of things like we want them to get their certifications if they don't already have them on the Google ad side and the Amazon side. We got some video training we want them to go through. We want them to shadow different roles in the company. So even if you're going to be a specialist, we want you to, to shadow AMs and, and the support team and stuff like that. Um, we want you to be on client calls, even if that won't be your main uh, goal uh, or main job later. We still want you to shadow calls. There's, there's a process hmm. of shadowing. We're also now we're, we're, we're promoting a guy to be uh, kind of over our training because now we're, we're onboarding enough people that we need someone to kind of oversee training. So we, we've taken, you know, input from our, our best specialists and our directors and kind of have a training wiki that we, that we send people through. And, and uh, Matthew, who's going to be our, our training director, he's kind of gamified some training too. So, that, so there's some, some things there that we send someone through. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as quickly as possible, we try to get them doing things. So we, we have a made up client, um, mm -hmm. called, uh, uh, spicy curry. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy on our team named Greg. He's super funny. Uh, and so he made up a team or made up a, a company. I like, I like hot sauce as well. My hot sauce guys. <laughs> called spicy yeah. curry. <laughs> we made a fake logo. It's great. Uh, so the, like the, the client has to, or the, the new employee has to do projects for spicy curry to see how they, how they do. Um, and, then, and then we get them rocking and rolling, you know, and so it's more of a 90 day process. So we kind of, we kind of, we kind of tell them, Hey, like, let's, let's give this 90 days, make sure you like it, make sure we like it, make sure everything goes well. And most people are sticking. We did have someone recently who, who, um, great person, like we really liked him, but we realized pretty quickly, like, no, nah, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And so we ended it after like a month, but, but that's rare. That's like, super, super rare uh, mm -hmm. because of our process. How do you, sorry, how do you spot that? Like without, was it more of a culture thing? Was it more of a. Yeah. Yeah. It was more technical. of a, this, this guy was like too laid back. Like he wasn't mm -hmm. really taking initiative in some, some areas. And we always say like in the hiring process that we're a really fun place to work. We're a supportive mm -hmm. place to work. We're not an easy place to work mm -hmm. because we're pretty demanding and things have to be done right. And then things move fast and clients have needs all the time. And, mm -hmm. and so it just kind of became clear, like after, I, I don't know, two or three check-ins that our director of that department had where she was like, yeah, he's not going to cut it. And uh, so we, we graciously ended it and it was, it was all fine. But, um, but yeah, so it was, it was, it was really watching like, Hey, are you, are you showing up like, like OMG should show up and, mm -hmm. and, and tackling the job the way that, the way that you should. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then in terms of, you talked about the executive team. So I, a couple of, just a couple of thoughts there. I like to meet with my executive team. Um, my CEO, uh, she and I meet uh, formally twice a month or we're we chatting every day about, about something. Mm -hmm. We have formal syncs with a, an agenda twice a month. 
we do our, our finance review together. We have other meetings together. Uh, and then all the department directors I meet with uh, from weekly to at least monthly, kind of again, just going through numbers and stuff. I think there, there's really two things you need to measure when you're working with an executive. Um, one is you got to measure the right inputs and the right outputs, right? So, so as we have KPIs, a lot of times we make those KPIs about the output, right? Uh, what, what sales growth and profitability and some of these things. And of course we have to measure that. that, that's important, but it's also really important to map out what are the inputs though that influence that? Because that's what you should be talking about most of the time. Cause that's how you affect the, the output, right? If I want to, I can measure, am I losing weight or am I gaining muscle? But, but what I really should be measuring is well, how many reps am I getting in and, and, mm. and how many times I work out this week and how much sleep am I getting in and what, what is, what is my uh, food intake and, and those things. So measure those things mm. and then the goal is going to kind of take care of itself. So it's like to look at that too. Of, okay. Um, what are we, what are we seeing from the people in this department and how, how are check-ins going there and, and, and things like that. So I think establishing what are the inputs and outputs that you have with your executive team. Um, and then, you know, c consistent communication. I'm not a micromanager, but I do want to check in and I do want to influence and I, and I am able to ask hard questions. I'm also a nice guy. I like people. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I want to dig into at least some of the details and, and, um, you know, really, really push, push the growth forward. So, right. So I have a question. Um, so let's say we want to grow by 20, let's say we want to grow by 25%. Uh, this year we did 1 million next year. We want to do, you know, um, let's say 50%, a million and a half. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the output right now you're saying, okay, well, what are the things that will go in there to influence that yeah. $500,000? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, some things could be like, let's say launching a new offer. So launching like a new service that yep. can add a hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Um, let's just use that as an example. Cause there's many other things. So launching a new offer. Okay, great. Hey guys, at the beginning of the year, you know, 2022, January, we're launching a new offer, uh, which will generate a hundred thousand dollars. And then that will bring out, bring us to $1.5 million. Now that new offer. So that's kind of level one. Now level two is like, there's obviously different things that you have to do to generate that new offer. Do you just give that to an executive team member? Be like, we're launching a new offer. This is what the offer is about. Now go do your job and go figure it out. That's not my job anymore. H mm -hmm. How does that process work, I guess? Yeah, so it kind of depends on um, what the area is, right? So there, there are certain areas that I feel like I, I bring a lot to the table and I want to mm -hmm. give input. Mm -hmm. um, so as an example on like the, the Google, Google ad side and the YouTube side. So we set some pretty lofty YouTube objectives and because I still like to be in the weeds there a little bit. And I still like to think about the creative offers and stuff. I'll sometimes give pretty detailed feedback. Now I want my specialists and my Google team to, to go, to go wild and think of ideas and do stuff too, but I'm going to be pretty detailed there. Cause I've got pretty detailed ideas. Uh, other sides of the business, like on the finance side or the accounting side, it's much more, this is what I want to see. Like this, this, this is, this is the number I need. And these are the things I need to see how you create it, how you do it. I don't care. Like, I just need to see it. Uh, so it does kind of depend on, on the area or, or maybe that there's somewhere in between like the account management department where uh, I, I, you know, fanatical about client care and client communication. So I'll definitely give input there, but, but in terms of the, uh, the, how they get there, that's more up to them. And I think that's, that's one of the, the clear uh, delineations that I've seen that I really like where, a lot of times the, the CEO is more about the what, like these, this is what we need to accomplish, but you know, the operations people and directors and things like that are more about the how. Um, and, 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 and sometimes it's, you know, that what is very general, uh, other times that, that what is pretty specific. So, mm. so yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I think the biggest issue with us is like, we, we don't have a very clear objective of like the overall company right now. Yeah. And we don't have a clear direction of, well, we all want to grow, but what is success? What is failure? Mm. We have, there's not really a number. And when there is a number, I just feel like it's literally just like something that we just thought of in thin air. There's, <laughs> it's not, it's yeah. not calculated. Yep. Um, and I also feel like right now, like we are hiring more people, but it's very much like, oh, hmm, what do we need next? Oh, actually, there's a there there there's a bucket right here, and then there's a you know uh, there's a hole right there. Let's plug that hole. Oh, let's plug <laughs> this hole. So it's yep. always like plugging holes without, I think, um, being more strategic about okay, what is the end result, and then let's kind of work backwards and hire the right people that way. But yeah. I think, I think I know what the issue. Like every day, I'm so in the business 
that I feel like it will be really helpful if I can just take like three days off, go somewhere with a paper and pen and kind of draw that out. Cause I, I think a lot of good things can happen when you're just like thinking by yourself. Then like, yeah, being, I totally being, agree with that. Totally agree with that. And I, and I do think that's, that is a big part of it saying, okay, this is our goal. So we're going to work backwards and, and okay, these are all the initiatives we have. So there's a new product launch, but what are all the things that make a new product launch successful? We got, you got ads, you got SEO, you got, you know, email marketing, you got Facebook ads, whatever. So we're, we're, we're mapping that out. And what, what do we expect from each channel and, and, and you know, set projections there. And then how do we make those successful? And, and so, but one of the things too, that I think is really important. And, and in some ways we're in the same boat where, we, we kind of know where we want to go. I mean, we know what we want to focus on as an agency and we, and I have ideas about how big we want to go, but I always, I always also always tell the team that, that we'll only continue to get bigger if we can also get better. If we're just getting bigger for the sake of getting better, I, I, bigger for the sake of being bigger, I don't want any part of it. I want to, want to also be excellent and, and, and improve in, in terms of what we're delivering and stuff too. Um, but I, I love what, what James, uh, I think James Clear, uh, author mm. of Atomic Habits. Have you read Atomic Habits? I haven't, but I've heard great yeah. things about that book. It is fantastic. One of the best books I've read probably in the last six or, or, or 12 months. Um, mm. But he says, hey, you don't, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And I really like that. And I think that kind of goes back to the input measurements as well. It's, I, I love the idea of setting a goal and then working backwards, but then determine what are your inputs? Because if you're not measuring your inputs and you're not doing that consistently, then, then you're just kidding yourself with the goal because you're not, you're not going to hit it. Uh, inputs are what, what's going to get you there. And then systems is what's going to get you there. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that got my head spinning. <laughs> if you got can. the wheels turning. Yeah, got the I'm wheels spinning. turning. No, I, I think, okay. and that's the type of stuff I feel like, Not, I mean, they don't teach that, they don't teach you about that in school. They don't. Correct. Yeah, like, how do all. you build a, how do you, I think businesses, there's different phases of a business, right? Like from zero to a hundred thousand and then a hundred thousand to a million, a million to 10, 10 to a hundred. Yeah. And each of those have different phases. And I think right now, like I'm at a phase where it's kind of new to me and this phase, like in order for me to actually go over to the next phase, like I need to learn about the team building, the culture, hiring the yeah. right people, setting up the systems and so on and so forth. So it's all new. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. That's what, that's why like business is fun. Cause it's always new. It, I totally agree, man. I, and, yeah. and back to the discussion about me not being able to paint in a, in a sequential manner because I get bored. That's one thing I love about business. Like there's always something new and always something different. And so I never get bored doing this, which, which is awesome. But a couple of quick recommendations. I do recommend the book traction. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion is it's not like the best written book. It's not one of those, you know, some, some business books like a, a shoe dog by Phil Knight, the guy from Nike. It's like, Oh, it's just a brilliant book. It's fun to read. It's just, it's brilliant. I think traction is really solid. It's got really good advice. It's not like a fun read. Mm -hmm. um, Scaling Up by Vern Harnish, also very good. Um, so I, I think looking at those and then kind of a, a, an Atomic Habits to, to, to pair with those. Atomic Habits definitely leans on the personal side of things, but also will, will impact your business. So I, I like those for determining system structure and, and scale. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Brett. Uh, I know we're kind of freestyled, but I, I thought yeah. it's it's very, very... Oh, my cat wants to say hi, apparently. Oh, oh hey, oh. what's up, El Gato? Oreo. What's, what's your cat's name? <laughs> His name is Oreo. Oreo. <laughs> Oreo. He's got a little bit... He's black it. and he's got a little bit of white patch. So uh, Nice. Yeah, I call him Oreo. He's nice. A, That's awesome. Anyways, Dude. well, Oreo, you want to say hi? Okay. Hey, Oreo. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Hello buddy. Hey, Brett. I, for those of you guys that are interested in, well, tell us uh, the, the services that you guys are offering right now. You said YouTube ads, you said Google Shopping, uh, Amazon PPC management. You guys are yep. rolling out uh, full service offers. Is there anything that else that I uh, missed? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, so really the entire Google ecosystem. So search and display and remarketing and stuff too. And then you know, on the Amazon side, it's all Amazon ads, Amazon DSP. And then we, we do have a full service offering where we're kind of slowly working into that. Yeah. So it's gotta be kind of the right fit. We have to have the bandwidth and stuff, but we can definitely uh, help there to a certain degree. So, so yeah, love to love to chat omgcommerce.com. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me on. This has been a blast. Yeah, absolutely. So guys, again, I have nothing but great things to say about these guys. I've worked with them for, for a long time now. <laughs> I worked with Oreo's them like, man, you can't have all the spotlight, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let get me, me get in, in here. here. Let me get in here and say something. I like to say something to the, to the viewers, to the fans. <laughs> to my fans, uh, to my people. Yeah, exactly. Awesome, guys. Yeah, so hit up OMG Commerce. And uh, again, thank you so much for the time, Brett. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. See ya. See ya.